Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you long distance. I am indeed uh, very relieved that I am not expanding my carbon footprint by traveling to Bonn and uh, speaking to you in person. And in any case, my footprint is rather gigantic and anything I can do to keep it in check is only to the betterment of all living species and this planet as a whole. Uh, and I'm sorry I can't be with you because uh, I just have a number of conflicting commitments which prevent me from uh, traveling uh, much as I would have liked to. I'm also very happy at the topic that's being discussed because I'm afraid this is an issue which has remained under-researched and has not received the kind of attention that it deserves. If you were to look at Article 2 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, then clearly the central objective of the convention is essentially to prevent that level of anthropogenic interference with the climate system which can be termed as dangerous. Now as it happens, nobody has really been able to come up with a definition of what represents dangerous. In a very vague sense, the fact that the G8 and the G20 and by and large several other organizations have now agreed on limiting temperature increase to 2 degrees Celsius is an expression of their concern that beyond two degrees perhaps we would be entering the arena of what could be termed as dangerous. But the reality is the protection of the poor, the maintenance of well-being of those who are likely to be affected most severely by the impacts of climate change has really not received the kind of attention it deserves. And I am therefore particularly happy that we are focusing on this issue. Now, in the IPCC, in the fourth assessment report, as well as the previous reports that the IPCC has carried out, we have tried to provide as much scientific evidence on the impacts of climate change and how they are likely to affect some of the most vulnerable regions and communities in the world. But certainly, defining what is dangerous is something that cannot be done by science because that involves value judgments. And so also is the case of the equitable dimensions of climate change because we know that the impacts are totally inequitable simply because some of the poorest communities in the world are firstly ill-equipped to be able to handle the impacts of climate change and secondly they are also going to be victims of perhaps some of the worst impacts of climate change. And here I want to highlight the fact that since we have large-scale poverty in several regions of the world, it would be tragic if we allow that state of poverty to become even more serious, even more intense. So this is clearly a challenge that the global community has to focus on, and I'd like to uh, compliment UNDP for taking this initiative, and we're very happy to be partners in this initiative involving UNDP and the South Center. I have always had a great deal of respect for both our partner organizations and we are certainly happy to be joining hands in this exercise. This year, as the UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, has clearly identified, is going to be the year of climate change, simply because we are leading up to Copenhagen, where it is expected that the world will come up with an agreement on how to deal on a multilateral basis with the growing challenge of climate change. Now, I'd like to mention that it's particularly important that, that in coming up with an agreement which essentially addresses all the dimensions of climate change as it is today and as it is projected to be in the future, as clearly brought out by the IPCC fourth assessment report, we should not lose sight of what climate change would do to the poor. I would like to emphasize what Mahatma Gandhi used to say repeatedly about each of our actions and all our decisions being seen in the light of what it means to the last man, as he said, which really meant how our actions or decisions would impact on the lives and the livelihoods of the most underprivileged. Now, I believe in global negotiations, when we are arriving at an agreement, that's going to be binding on all the countries of the world, we hope, then we must ensure 
that the most vulnerable, the most underprivileged communities and regions of the world are kept clearly in focus and their interests have to be protected come what may. And this is where I would like to emphasize the equitable and the ethical dimensions of climate change. Any agreement that we come up with must clearly observe the need for us to maintain equity and an ethical basis for whatever actions are taken. Uh, in the case of uh, the impacts of climate change on the poor, there are a whole range of factors that we have to keep in mind. And these vary from place to place. Just to give you an example, we know that water resources are going to be severely impacted as a result of the changes that are taking place. And these arise out of changes in precipitation patterns. We know, for instance, in some tropical and subtropical areas, there is a decline in precipitation taking place, including in the Mediterranean region, whereas in the upper latitudes, there is a tendency towards increase in precipitation. We also know that extreme precipitation events are on the increase and there is also a greater frequency, intensity and duration of floods, droughts and heat waves. And all of these are going to become far more intense and far more frequent in the future. So this being the case, we know that it's some of the poorest of the poor across the globe who are going to be impacted by these occurrences. Particularly severe is the condition of the poor in low-lying coastal areas or in the small island states. I come from India and in our neighborhood we have an entire country, Bangladesh, which is low-lying, which has low coastlands and has very dense population. So clearly they are going to be extremely vulnerable. Parts of India itself are not distinctly different from Bangladesh and people over there in some of these coastal areas face identical conditions as you find in Bangladesh or for that matter in the small island states, some of which incidentally are very, very poor. So therefore, it is important for us to keep in mind how the impacts of climate change are going to affect the lives of some of the most underprivileged communities and societies in the world. And it seems to me that whatever agreement we come up with in Copenhagen must not only provide for adequate financial resources to help some of these communities adapt to the impacts of climate change, but also in ensuring that development assistance does not get diverted for this purpose. Development assistance in any case is totally inadequate even though the global community has been upholding the target of 0.7% of the GDP of the rich countries as being the norm at which we might ensure the flow of development assistance to the poor countries in the world. The record is certainly far below that. There are some countries, of course, that are meeting the 1% goal that is really most laudable, but there are others, some of the richest countries, uh, way behind and way below even the 0.7% norm for provision of development assistance. So I think Copenhagen is a unique opportunity where not only can we carry out on a global basis uh, the implementation of solutions to meet the challenge of climate change, but also ensure that we bring about some degree of equity and some adherence to ethical principles by which some of the poorest regions in the world can be protected, at least from the worsening conditions that they would face if we didn't take any action. But far more important to my mind is the need for the developed countries to bring about a major reduction in the emissions of greenhouse gases. Because whatever we do by way of adaptation, it's apparent now that in a short period of time, we would have exceeded our ability and capacity to be able to absorb and to be able to adapt to the impacts of climate change. The ultimate solution, therefore, lies in bringing about major reduction in the emissions of greenhouse gases because it is imperative that we stabilize the climate of this earth. And if we don't, 
then clearly the impacts on some of the poorest regions in the world will be disastrous and certainly irreversible in several cases. Let me highlight a few figures for you which may be relevant to the issue that we are discussing today. If we look at the increase in water stress uh, in several parts of the world, our projection in the IPCC is that as early as 2020, in, on the continent of Africa, we would have something like 75 to 250 million people living in a state of water stress as a result of climate change. Now, I want to emphasize that this water stress is not being caused entirely by climate change because there are existing conditions which in any case are very unsatisfactory and are causing severe distress and a great deal of scarcity as far as water availability is concerned. But climate change exacerbates these conditions and would therefore push over a large number of people into the region where you might say they are suffering from the effects of water stress. I also want to highlight the fact that the impacts of climate change on agriculture are generally negative in most regions of the world. There are some regions where you might have an increase in yields for a short period of time. But once climate change reaches a certain threshold, then all these regions will also see a negative impact on yields. But if you take the continent of Africa, then again, as early as 2020, we are likely to see a major reduction in the yields of some crops, as much as 50% in some cases. And therefore, large numbers of people who in any case are living under conditions of malnutrition and hunger, progressive and persistent hunger, are obviously going to be affected by this condition of reduced agricultural yields as much as 50% as early as 2020. May I say that there's a large number of farmers all across the developing world uh, who are totally dependent on rain-fed agriculture. I would say that the large number of these farmers who are dependent on rain-fed agriculture are going to be adversely affected by the impacts of climate change. And therefore, it's likely that poverty for a very large number of these farmers will only get much worse over a period of time. So what are the interventions that are required to protect them? You certainly need institutional mechanisms like insurance, crop insurance for some of these people. And this is where I think both government and business can work hand in hand. You certainly need much better research and development by which we can meet uh, the needs of these poor farmers, particularly keeping in mind the fact that the extent of rainfall that they may be able to benefit from in their agriculture would probably decrease in the future. So I think R&D efforts have to target much greater drought resistance as far as crops are concerned. And you also need investments in infrastructure whereby you can adapt to the impacts of climate change, particularly as they relate to more frequent and more intense floods and droughts. So I think the challenges are extensive. I think we need to clearly map out which sections of society are going to be most adversely affected and where is it that poverty is likely to get worse and where is it that the removal of poverty would be hindered by the impacts of climate change. And it is in this context that I'm very happy that this particular meeting is being organized because the, uh, the subject and the theme of this discussion today is really something that affects a very large number of people across the globe, uh, a large number who normally do not fit into the radar screens of the development community or often even of the governments in their own country. So therefore, it is of particular value to us that three organizations have joined hands to bring about this discussion, to bring about analysis of the problems of poverty and how they are linked with climate change. And it's not enough to only identify the problems. I think we should come up with solutions. We should come up with the roadmap of initiatives, which I hope you will be able to do during the course of the day, because 
these initiatives will have to be implemented by organizations like UNDP, but also I would say at the grassroots level through the involvement of civil society. And I hope this is where the South Center can play an extremely important role. We as an institute that does research but also does a lot of action on the ground would be delighted to join hands for anything that you want to implement as the outcome of this workshop because I believe that we have neglected the problem much too long and to do so any longer would clearly be a dereliction of duty. It would clearly be a, a show of complete insensitivity to something that is obviously going to affect some of the most unfortunate, the underprivileged people of this world and that's an issue that none of us should accept and we should all do something about it. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you and I'm delighted to do so without having to travel all the way to Bonn. I hope you have a very successful meeting and I also hope that the outcome of the meeting will find shape in practical implementation of, of some of the recommendations, some of the thoughts that come out of this discussion because I think we need, I think we need new ideas. In the absence of new ideas, we would be stuck. We would really not be able to make any progress and the poor will continue to suffer, perhaps far worse than they have done in the past. So thank you very much.